Welcome everybody, my name is Richard Tufts, I'm the director of Erin. Um, Erin is a network of regions and we're very pleased with the West Midlands and Greater Birmingham and Warwick University uh, members. Um, this is uh, what we would call a Warwick University impact event and this is one of many that we've had here and which shows the quality of the academic research at the university. So we're very, very pleased to have people here uh, and not just from the Warwick University but from other experts as well here today. So it's a very uh, welcome time. This is also, we're talking about global diaspora globalization and this is an ERC project and that we know from our Commissioner Moidash that the ERC of course is the jewel in the crown of European research. So we're very, very pleased to have that uh, repetition here. But one of the things is, I think, although we come from a research and innovation network in Erin, and we're really looking at that, but what is interesting is that how much we've got an interest from our regions on this topic of migration uh, from universities, from various areas now. And we've seen this just, what we've often looked at is obviously the flows of migration. We've already had a, a, a Warwick event here already on migration flows. Uh, but this is now looking more on the role of the diaspora, and I think that's a much more interesting area and a much longer term debate, of course. And we've just seen that in terms of recently in the Netherlands and the Turkish diaspora. We also, of course, now being part of, I was just reading about Sweden's budget, the European budget is going to be sort of saying we're not going to do, raise our budget unless people deal with the migration issue. So it's even starting to hit budget discussions now around that area. And of course, as a Brit abroad, I'm now in my own diaspora of here, of a Brexit Brit in left in Brussels. So it's becoming a sort of an area of debate now on that level. So we've got two presentations to start with. The first is from Maria Koinova, and she's a senior associate professor of <coughs> international relations of university. She's going to kick off the, the, the debate and the, the first presentation. And But we're very, very pleased to have Dr. Daniel Nauyox from Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. Is that right? <coughs> Not quite the real school, but on that level. And he's going to be the second presentation. He's just arrived from the Nikita States, so thank you very much for coming. And then we're going to have three reactions from colleagues at the moment who are sitting at the front and they'll be brought up to give a quick reaction to the presentations and then we throw it open for a good 30 minutes of questions from you for the whole panel. So that's the way we should finish around 17.30 and I believe there's going to be a, a nice welcome glass of white wine to celebrate this wonderful weather. So um, without further ado, I'd like to th thank Dr. Maria Coyne, who's going to start us off. I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, interest in the project and our work with Daniel. So we have been collaborating on one specific part of the project, which was about sending states. So this is how we are both on, on, on that uh, discussion today. But I will be talking more about um, the larger project. OK, so the ERC uh, starting grant, Diasporas and Contested Sovereignty, has been a really large scale migration project in the sense that it has been um, big in terms of uh, um, in terms of spending, but also in terms of uh, the idea and the ambition about what it wants to achieve. So it was uh, it started in 2012 <coughs> and uh, is finishing in uh, September 2017. In five years, uh, this project has been focused on the central question about what are the conditions and causal mechanisms which are facilitating the diaspora mobilizations abroad. So this is a very very big uh, question, and certainly it is very important about how the diasporas after they mobilize have an impact on the countries uh, of origin where they come from. But the specific focus uh, physically of the diaspora that we have been looking at uh, have been the UK, uh, Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, and France. And the groups that we have been looking at have been uh, the Albanian, Armenian, Palestinian, Bosnian, Iraqi, and Kurdish diaspora. So you see that these are all conflict generated diasporas, which is uh, a very central word in, in the definition. Conflict generated diasporas are those that are emerging from conflicts. This may be refugees, the refugees of today, uh, will turn someday into conflict generated diasporas when they settle and stay in, in uh, host states. Uh, but this could be also the descendants and the children of these uh, people because they may be socialized with the idea of the conflict, like imagine, for example, a whole generation 
of uh, you know, people just um, socialized with Armenian genocide. So this is a very important idea because it is not simply any diaspora that has been formed on the basis of voluntary migration. It is the refugee-based diaspora, whether the refugee of experience or refugee by way of socialization. So the other important part of the project has been about the contested sovereignty. As you will see, for example, um, later the work of uh, Daniel, he wouldn't be talking that much about contested sovereignty because the contested sovereignty has been very, very crucial of our project and crucial about how we think about institutions uh, to which these diasporas are connected. So this is uh, basically the plan of the uh, work that we have done um, throughout the years. I have been working on diasporas which are linked to de facto states. These are Kosovo, Palestine, and Nagorno-Karabakh. So de facto states are states that have some governance locally, uh, which is not very strong. So these are areas that are governed by certain um, self-governance structures. But they have problems with their external sovereignty because they are not acknowledged as members of the international system of the UN, etc. Or they are partially acknowledged like Kosovo today. They may be connected to a irredentist power in the, in the sense of, of Armenia, or they are more on the road of um, emergence uh, like Palestine. So the other type of diaspora is the stateless diaspora. Sometimes one can think that maybe Palestinians are a stateless diaspora, but they do have uh, an establishment of governance in the West Bank, in Gaza. While the Kurdish diaspora has been truly, in that sense, stateless, <coughs> that they has been they having connections to southern Turkey, to Iran, to Iraq, but there is no statelet that really attracts it as, as a whole. So the third uh, uh, part has been um, the work on the weak states. So here, two of my students have been working on Bosnia and Iraq. So here you see that this is a these are countries that exist on the map of the world. They are part of the members, uh, membership of the, uh, the uh, UN system, but they have very weak internal institutions, like um, uh, which are very divided across uh, uh, ethno-sectarian uh, lines, ethnic uh, and national lines more in the Bosnian case, and sectarian uh, more in the Iraqi case. And then we are currently proceeding with a large-scale uh, uh, cross-national survey which is looking not simply to the diaspora entrepreneurs or the activists that are seeking to mobilize others, but with randomly selected uh, people from certain groups. So this is the scope of the project. So I have selected six uh, recommendations, six um, ideas on which to build uh, policy recommendations, if that would be possible. Or this, this is the view of the academics to reach out to the policy people and uh, seek uh, uh, collaboration <coughs> or at least correspondence. So the first important idea has been about uh, diaspora socio-spatial positionality. And uh, this is coming uh, mostly from my work. So the idea here is that there has been a lot of thinking with regard to diasporas, homelands, and hostlands. In this triangular relationship where diasporas are very much related to and there are these international institutions. What I'm saying is that it is very important to think about these systems of relationships that exist among diasporas, but they happen in transnational social fields. Transnational social fields have been very important for sociology. In political science in which this project has been embedded, they haven't been that much discussed. And moreover, they haven't been discussed in the socio-spatial type of relationship. So in this moment, this uh, element E, which is the central idea, let's say these are Albanians in, in Brussels. Right? These Albanians in Brussels are connected not simply to Kosovo, that may be A, uh, or to Albania, that probably is uh, another uh, host sta uh, home state, but they are connected also to uh, Albanians in um, Macedonia, to Albanians in uh, uh, Montenegro, to Albanians in Australia, to Albanians in the US. So this is the field of relationships in which these, uh, uh, in these mobilizations happen. And this is really important to reframe the way in which, in which we do that uh, thinking about that because it is much easier to think about hostess and hostess and, host, uh, and um, diaspora well, this is an important way of reframing um, the way of thinking about mobilizations. 
And to give you a couple of examples about how this positionality goes deeper into the discussion, I think this is one of the big findings <coughs> of this project. So the first one is if you imagine, so in, um, in the Netherlands, the proximity of Bosnians, Croats, and Serbs, and Kosovars to the Hague, which is uh, the big uh, uh, legal capital that lots of people call in the world. So in the Hague, uh, there has been a lot of activity with the International Criminal Tribunal of former Yugoslavia. There has been connectivity of people being taking part in it, or being uh, a site of a lot of protests, of different types of protests. And this is not a place simply where people from the environment of the Netherlands are connected, but people are busting to from uh, Croatia, from Bosnia, from other parts in order to protest there. So it becomes that space, contentious space, uh, which is based on that idea of proximity um, uh, and positionality in that field. So if you are a mobilizer in the diaspora in uh, around issues of transitional justice, the best place would be basically to be empowered by the context of the Netherlands. So this is very interesting to think not simply about the agency, but about the context and how context shapes um, these mobilizations. The other one um, is on Palestinians that I have uh, published in the European Journal of International Relations. You could think about um, Palestinians, Armenians, and, um, and uh, Kosovars being connected differently to the place in which they are. So and depending on where their socio-spatial connections are stronger, this is how they mobilize. People who have closer connections to the people or to institutions in, which, in the state in which they live, they may be more prone to do certain sort of lobbying or civic activism, which is locally. And people who have connections which are out there, somewhere in other parts of the world, like the Palestinians, they may be in the Palestinian territories, they may be in Jordan, they may be in the camps in Lebanon, they may be more pushed out of the space in which they So physically one can be, all of us can be walking in the world room and we will be physically here, geographically, but socio-spatially, different mobilizers will be differently connected to the place and to different other places. And that matters for this mobilization. So what is the recommendation, I think, uh, from this? It's re really important to think beyond host states and home states and diasporas, and especially for these groups that are with regard, uh, that are really related to politics of uh, contested sovereignty. Contested sovereignty matters because there are minorities and groups outside of the whole state that are also very mobilized. And probably that's just one of the differences that we have with other, with other states which are more monolithic, stronger, and, and their institutions um, um, are able to execute more and stronger policies. And the other one is to ask more questions. Sometimes I think that in the policy world, because functions in such a, uh, a quick pace, a lot more is about finding solutions rather than asking questions. But I do think that the questions are really important. If one wants to engage with diasporas from a certain country or a certain place, one would want to think about how does certain context empower these diaspora entrepreneurs? Does it empower them to become more legally active or to use more the media or to use more finances? How is the context really behind? How are these diaspora entrepreneurs linked to their country of origin and other contexts in that field? It is not simply, oh, what is the relationship to their host state? Because something right there in an adjacent area, like for example with Macedonia and some recent events, one can watch them, one can mobilize about them, but if policymakers are looking simply about Kosovo or simply about, about Albania, they wouldn't be able to capture that dynamic. And the other one is about how are diasporas positioned vis-a-vis -vis other migrant groups in a certain country, because in a certain country you may have abilities to be um, on a certain sort of like uh, uh, implicit hierarchies higher or lower, and this may empower or disempower people uh, in their mobilization processes. So the second idea is about critical events. And these critical events are not coming simply from the homeland, but they are coming also from other global locations. So the, the idea is that the diasporas here respond to a number of critical events there. I mean, I try to put this in a, in a more simple way to, to think about what the there is that we may need to really unpack. Contentious mobilizations um, um, exist very much when there is a large-scale violence or people are 
uh, ethnically cleansed. So these are the moments where, from our research, uh, it shows that it is the moment when people in the diaspora really radicalize. And the mechanism, if you remember, we're asking what is the mechanism for, is that a very emotional, strong attachment, either by way of direct relationships to people in which, uh, in which they are connected through family ties or anything else, or it is by way of the media and that long, di long distance um, association of nationalism that happens by way of the media and exposure of the violent, uh, violent events. But there are other critical events, and this is a very rich project in which a lot of things started coming up, even not anticipated uh, in the beginning. For example, critical events uh, include referendums, and in your package I have included my article in the conversation recently, <coughs> which I published about how Erdogan is seeking the diaspora abroad for uh, referendum purposes. And it is also about peace processes and when they have their breakdown. I mean, Palestinians, for example, from the UK, some very important people were very much engaged in the peace process in uh, Oslo 1993. So other events are elections, and sometimes there could be decrease of rights in the countries of origin or elsewhere, and they could also have these effects of mobilization abroad. Although we see that it is less about um, intensity of diaspora mobilization when we have elections. If there are rigged elections, probably this is uh, more problematic. But what, what my point is here is that we have different events on different parts of the world uh, that are inducing diasporas to have different intensities <coughs> of mobilization. So if you think about intensity, and from there it could be radical, moderate, long, long term, short term, etc. So this is my article, probably um, you have it, maybe you can read it later. So it is showing how the, the idea about um, uh, the, the home state uh, seeking diasporas abroad for a referendum dynamic can turn uh, from uh, a regular uh, extraterritorial ideas of voting into uh, not a large-scale crisis, but a state of de definitely a diplomatic level. So from the low politics of extraterritorial voting to the high politics of uh, uh, international affairs and affairs between states. So um, the recommendation on that is that tactic crisis <coughs> there it's important to think about engaging diasporas here. So one, when, once crisis happened there, what usually policymakers do, and I come from conflict studies, is that <coughs> they're seeking solution, peacekeeping solutions, uh, 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 peace processes to tackle re relationships there. What really is important is to think in this transnational dynamic way to engage also diasporas here who might be active and engaged in these processes, but they remain beyond the radar screen. So if one wants to resolve conflicts and conflict situations and there is continuing radical support from abroad, one can put a lot of effort there, but there is nothing in, in response to, to that part here. So in that sense, I think this is really important to think about. So the, in that sense, diasporas need not be omitted as irrelevant actors. And very often, diasporas are used as, um, as uh, information providers in this kind of uh, processes. But it is important, I argue, uh, to engage them in uh, very uh, uh, peace building initiatives and also in long term political development. It's not simply about remittances, and it's not simply about uh, small and medium enterprises where mostly the effort so far has been. So the third one is about diasporas and transitional justice. So this is where I have worked uh, mostly with my student, Janeta Karabegovic. So uh, showing that uh, different discussions from different parts of the world have been showing very, very exceptionally that diasporas can be connected to truth commissions, criminal tribunals, uh, genocide recognition, and memorization. And this is again beyond the radar screen. Uh, probably, you, if you think of somebody may, mentions the traditional justice, to you will think about criminal court, you will think about uh, apologies, but you will never think about diasporas who are abroad and they're engaging in this process. <coughs> so what we show in one of our articles is that is in, in specific uh, um, concentration camps uh, survivors who were connected to uh, former um, Yugoslavia and the war uh, at, at the time, 
So they have been trying to memor memorialize one of their very uh, painful experiences, and they have been trying to do this on a very translocal basis. It is not simply from uh, one country to another, it's not simply to uh, do something about Bosnia Herzegovina, but just to do something about the Priador area. Well, this is where the things happen. Most people in the diaspora are Priador oriented people. So this is the translocalism that our diaspora project is also bringing into the picture. So here also I'm showing a picture which I took uh, in precast. So this is the place um, uh, where 1998 the cost of liberation army was really growing. Um, and uh, where a lot of the ho whole family uh, was uh, ma massacred of one of the Kosovo Liberation Army leaders. So today this is a commemoration place uh, where not simply anybody goes, but this is the uh, diaspora minister that is on the left side and the front. This is a, another person who is from the Yashari family, so that's a very established And a lot of people from the diaspora. So it does become the space and place where commemoration happens. Uh, it is very local and translocal, though, and becoming very, very um, important in its implications. So in that sense, there is a proactive need for translocal engagement. Uh, because states and policymakers are engaging diasporas uh, in very, very, not, not very much in transitional justice processes, I think in the first place, we need to proactively think about that. But the other is to think about the translocal dimension. Because if you think today, a person or people who have been displaced from Aleppo may be much more, um, uh, much more strongly connected to their place or the grievances that they have if they, uh, uh, compared to others who might be uh, from other parts of Syria. So in a certain sense, maybe a solution to do that would not be go to Syria directly do transitional justice process on the whole state, but to do it on a translocal basis, to do something with, with Priador, to do something with Srebrenica, to do something with, with Trenica, to do something along these lines in order to be able to tackle certain grievances and transform them when they are problematic. So, and other thing which is in the uh, diasporas in transitional justice um, uh, 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 work, is about a contention between diasporas and host states. And this is something very counterintuitive. And when I, when I went to the Netherlands in 2012, I went with a questionnaire that didn't have questions which are about <coughs> Srebrenica. And what I realized is that the whole discussion of the Bosnians, Croats, and Serbs in the Netherlands was uh, surrounded about how the Dutch battalion in 2010 um, 1995 uh, managed to uh, tackle the, the Srebrenica enclave and, and this whole um, massacre and genocide that, they, that, that took place afterwards. So this is the, the idea in the sense that the, the diaspora is not simply having a contention with somebody else in some other parts of the world, but with the whole state in which they live. We do comparisons, for example, um, when you think today about um, a certain groups like uh, Palestinians uh, and the Balfour Declaration. I don't know whether it has come to you by some way. There is a huge mobilization on the centering of the Balfour Declaration. And this is an important thing for that entire community, but it has been a grievance much prior to the centenary. So it's not the centenary that is bringing the, the, uh, the claim. It is something that is just exacerbating in a sense, one can see diaspora connections to their host states, where it could be about politically neutral states. For example, Sweden is politically neutral in international relations most often than not. And when you have mobilizations, and there are lots of mobilizations, like Kurds are mobilized, Palestinians are mobilized, Iraqi communists are mobilized, they, are, they, are, they may be sustained in their mobilization, but they're not that uh, transgressive or, or, or problematic mobilizations are like in other places. And on the contrary, you may have more contentious diaspora mobilization in host states which are associated with historic, sorry, historical or contemporary violence, military intervention like Iraq, or contested colonial processes. So it is about the relationship between the diaspora and the state. So here I think that you know, if policymakers want to resolve problems there, they would need to acknowledge that some of the contention might be here. This is, again, this kind of refrain. 
and develop mechanisms to better relationships with diasporas if that would be uh, possible. Uh, there are a couple of uh, other very small points which I wanted to say. So this is, um, um, we went through a very rigorous coding procedure through a lot of interviews from all the members and we extrapolated them on another group of interviews and we went to one of the videos actually is, um, that is displayed out that is speaking about this in detail. And what this has been showing is that we know all that diasporas are not groups, essentially groups, Armenians, Palestinians, etc. although it's convenient to name them like this, but these are groups of Armenian um, allegiances with certain parties or, or certain groups or certain social strata. But what we are showing is through this mining of, of data that comes from all of this um, uh, information is the profile of the diaspora entrepreneur. I mean, this is a little bit still in, in the making, uh, I just need to say, but what we are seeing there is that this is usually a male gender, that they have had a lot of transit experience, and they are seeking access to institutions. So all this, what we are seeing in the media is about people who um, are very afraid of somebody who takes up the lone wolf uh, terrorism profile or um, is connected to cells, etc. This, this may be some of the diaspora entrepreneurs, but the book of what we have been seeing is about this type of people. So how do we deal with this type of people to do it better? Taco individual agency, when people connect to uh, diasporas, they need to look into the gender dimension and ask if there are a lot of male mobilizers ask for the women there. Think about what are the detrimental effects of the crisis today about the long-term uh, transition uh, uh, in transit processes, which I think, in my view, is creating more mobilized people for the future. And also think about how institutions can open themselves for more access for the, for the future uh, lobbying. So because these people who are the mobilizers from all groups uh, <coughs> that we have talked about are more interested in integration, but also in voicing their ideas about foreign policy. And there are mostly processes about integration, but there are few processes about foreign policy. And the final part, and this is where I build on, on the connection to Daniel, when we have had the discussions and the um, uh, collaborative uh, work, is about how sending states, which are in this contested sovereignty world, that they are engaging with diasporas again on the socio-spatial positionality principle. And they may be engaging because they need some funds from abroad, they may need some cultural engagement, or they may need to govern the diasporas abroad, but they do this on a, this socio-spatial geographical principle as well. And sometimes what we may see, for example, other big states which are not contested states are engaging a lot of their diasporas on a civic, um, uh, citizenship principle with contested states, whenever they're engaging the diaspora abroad, it is mostly on a national, nationalist principle. So they are seeking the major majority bearing diaspora in practice. Whatever is written in paper is different. And see how I, I show here that Kosovo has a positional engagement with diasporas abroad, for example, about how the different contexts are empowering their diasporas. Um, the, the United States or Germany and Switzerland are very strong about the, the cost of a de facto state in practice looking for uh, diaspora mobilization about uh, small enterprises or support for larger enterprises, so the business uh, uh, element. And for the UK, for example, they're very interested in developing public diplomacy because they think these are educated people, but also the environment is the one that fosters them. And interestingly also Sweden is a place where one would not expect so much the education part to come from because it is a very educated place, but the whole important part is that Sweden is giving minorities and migrants who are coming uh, with five or six children <coughs> abroad, but is giving them free education, and in one decade or, or 15 years, they are uh, able to, to educate themselves. And uh, many of these people were able to return to Kosovo the favor about ideas about who do better education and develop curricula, etc. So it is the context, a lot about the context in a project that we uh, think about. And the final part is saying about this recommendation. I think that diasporas need to engage um, 
they were put to utter a mechanism and of civic uh, engagement. So these are specific mechanisms that need to be there. And how do diaspora, uh, diasporas are engaged in de facto states um, through specific uh, flows and specific positional processes that need to be acknowledged? Because it is how people mobilize if one wants to design certain, um, certain policies that needs to be part of so thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Noyox. I'm. It's a pleasure to be with you here and to share some of my research findings with you. Um, I'm always a pleasure to share the panel with Maria, who has done a, a tremendous work on a very broad basis and. Um, whatever she says, it's only like the, the, the highlights of her work. Like I've followed what she's been doing over the years and looked at methodology. It's really amazing what is under these peaks that she's presenting here. My own approach is a little different. Um, I have many different research projects and it's just a couple of highlights that I'm presenting here. It's not one coherent strategy, but a couple of uh, things that I hope will be interesting to, um, to some of you. Um, what I'm basically trying to do is to unpack the entire migration and public policy arena and trying to, to highlight where diaspora mobilization can play a key role. And that is very important, first for the um, Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development that, as you know, was adopted a year and a half ago with the UN General Assembly setting out the major development strategy until 2030, not only for developing countries, but for the entire range of all countries in the world over including the European Union. And of course, um, and this year the um, global um, discussions of the UN Global Compacts, one on um, responsibility sharing for refugees, another one on safe, orderly and regular migration are taking place at the GA, um, hopefully leading to these two UN com Global Compacts on migration. And I think some of those things will be important for that. I have five major points that I'm trying to make. First, I'm going to talk about a little bit about migration diaspora development, then about transnationalization of public policies, about policies that need to build on um, migrants' interests. Um, I talk a little bit about diaspora stakeholder participation, and I will conclude with a few slides very briefly on impact assessment of public policies towards these populations. Um, sustainable development outcomes are related to migration in four key ways. First is migration is development. And that we often forget that, that emigration to mobility itself leads people to have higher incomes, to have more freedom, more things that we associate with, um, with human development. So um, that's the first dimension. Then of course we know that the lack of development or development and uh, positive development affects immigration and emigration. The lack of may be a root cause of, of emigration, Higher development may be, may be a, a attracting factor for immigration. And of course, displacement is, um, can be um, not described as a lack of peace and security. Um, very importantly, of course, migrants are contributors to social, to, um, social and sustainable development. And we know that for immigrants and diaspora populations who contribute through remittances, diaspora investments, knowledge transfers, etc., etc., to development. However, also immigrants, also refugees are contributors be it in their home countries, be it in the countries they settle in. And the last one is when you come from a core development area, um, you look at these populations as targets for um, development um, initiatives. So you look at, them at, pop at vulnerable populations, you look at immigrants, <coughs> refugees, immigrants, IDPs, internally displaced persons as vulnerable people whose migrant specific um, vulnerabilities should be considered. And, um, and all these have certain policy implications that I'm briefly outlining right now. I won't go too much into the root causes, and I'd be happy to discuss that in the Q&A, but um, just a little takeaway point here. Root cause, um, um, to address the push factors, can enable people to stay home if they wish so. They should never, ever try to prevent migration, what some institutions are trying to put. And, and we again, can discuss that later. Um, look at migra migration as development. States can facilitate emigration or immigration. They can enable safe migration, migration routes, and they can maximize the human development outcomes of this migration through a variety of options. Um, when we talk about contributions, and that's the main area of diaspora mobilization, um, the first thing is 
states can enable them to contribute. And I get to that in a few slides and more in detail. Um, and of course, there is a link between these two because the more people migrate, the in better conditions they migrate, the more enabled they are to contribute. That enabling element is often missing from our diaspora and um, engagement strategies. Creating trust, Maria mentioned that, and um, it's, it's one of the key, um, key areas for government agencies. Most of the most difficult ones, easy to say create trust, another one is to create trust. Um, affect narratives, narratives are really important right now in the refugees and the immigrant perspective, but also for diaspora outreach, for the outreach um, um, endeavors, narratives are really important and either as policymakers or as people in, this, um, in, this, in the academia or in civil society can actually affect these narratives into the positive or the negative. And of course you can facilitate or induce contributions, you ask for remittances, you make remittances, foreign direct investments, buy the asper, etc. easier. And the last one is to um, look at, at um, these mobile populations as target or vulnerable populations. <coughs> Here, just my, my, uh, my plea to look at not only to go beyond the humanitarian aid and go towards long-term development solutions, try to enable them, and ideally to make them from turn them from vulnerable populations into populations that contribute to sustainable development. The SDGs, um, adopted again a year and a half ago um, in September in New York, um, um, have many references to um, migration and displacement, SDGs being the Sustainable Development Goals. And the, the Agenda 2030 definitely um, mentions the positive contribution of migrants and for inclusive growth. It also recognizes that migration is a multi-dimensional reality which requires coherent and comprehensive responses. You don't have to look at this in detail, this is just um, from a new report that just finished for um, the UN Working Group on um, um, Migration in the Arab Region, where I look at how these four dimensions, again, migration development, um, contributors, target populations, development affecting um, um, mobility, are related to a lot of SDGs. SDGs meaning um, social protection, um, health, education. So these policy areas are in all four sectors important for migration, including for diaspora. And that means when we talk about migration, we look at, look at employment policies, economic development policies, environment climate change policy, SME, FDI, the entire area of public policies are or can be related to migration and displacement. That's something we call mainstream migration, mainstream migration into development, sectoral development policies, which is really key when you want to understand how to govern migration and refugees and diaspora populations better. Um, originally, uh, the diaspora outreach was, um, you had institutions on diaspora investments and some on culture and diaspora. Then there came a new wave where we had one-stop shop diaspora ministries or institutions that only dedicated for diaspora outreach. Now what we see is um, more and more diaspora and science, <coughs> healthcare, agriculture, diplomacy, that's just a selection of issues are related to these um, issues. And that of course has institutional implications for the nodal ministries on diaspora, which then have to connect to ministries, to actors in these fields who often don't see themselves as key actors on migration. They say, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a health person, I'm not a migration person, but then you have to convince these people to work with you on diaspora and health, on immigrant and health. Um, so these are institutional applications. The same thing is for immigrant engagement policies, where you have traditionally the Ministry of Interior and the Refugee Agency, and um, we have Peter Bonin here from the um, 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 German um, International Corporation for Development, um, GIZ, who, who knows the struggles with the um, Interior Ministry and their own um, head, the Ministry of Development Corporation, which then have to reach out and have to engage with all these different um, um, actors um, to actually devise public policies that are relevant for migrants and diaspora actors. This leads me to another really important area of, of public policy making for diaspora which I call the transnationalization of public policies, which I call like this because it sounds very cool. Um, traditionally, the nation, the nation state um, makes policies for people within the boundary um, uh, jurisdiction. <coughs> of course, we know some people move out of this nation state, some people move out, and after moving out, they move back in. And I could say they move back and forth, back and forth. So, Policies these days have to consider this, these transnational linkages, these transnational movements, transnational livelihood strategies of people. 
For example, in the health area, states and, and other actors, institutions, the, 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 the private sector can be, ha, has to be an important part of that, can look for health insurance for immigrants, for temporary workers who often fall between the cracks, or for returnees who again often are outside these policy schemes. Often the diaspora can contribute to the uh, in health insurances for people staying home. Or, again, the cooperation between the country of origin and country of destination being a transnational phenomenon, often that means I have to span boundaries. And um, as Maria pointed out in her presentation, it's not always state and state. Often we have these translocal connections where it is municipalities at the local level who are, um, who are cooperating, who are doing things. The health level less so, the health insurance level, but at many other prov service provision at, and at the um, connection level, it's the, it's the lower, the sub-national levels that are important. The same I could argue for education, for social security, and other policy areas that are increasingly transnational or should be more transnational in their policy outreach. Policies definitely need to build on migrants' interests. These are a few things that are very classic when, when like, I advise a lot of governments, I work with UNDP and other UN agencies, and, and to, to channel investments, I mean, charity contributions, savings into sustainable development from the diaspora is one of the key areas every state is interested in. They know the World Bank statistics on remittances, and they say if I got just 10% of this um, 5 billion that my country is getting according to statistics, I'd be great. So that's like understandable. So um, I'm working, and um, there's a lot of crowdfunding for agricultural development, climate change adaptation, social development, there are for savings schemes, there are for angel investment platforms, fund matching schemes, etc., etc. What's really important is that states often say, we would like to tap into this remittances. And personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with tapping into that, but it's not just you getting money from them. You have to work with the self-interest of the migrants and the diaspora actors. And you have to understand the self-interest. If you just say, give me some of your money, channel some into my platforms, as some actors unfortunately do, that's bound to fail. I developed a very complicated, very sophisticated um, system, a framework I call ADAPT, which stands for <laughs> Ability, Decision, and Permissibility, which is based on the idea that whether people act for development, meaning permitting, investing, trading, returning, lobbying, or in the immigration context, being economically active or self-sustaining, depends on whether they can do that, whether they decide to do it, and whether they're allowed to it. And um, so, so, so these are the determinants of migrants' engagement, and these are the intended impacts. Public policy has several areas where public policy can come in there. For example, the decision of individuals to invest or to remit or to return is often um, contingent on the trust that it has with the government and government um, programs. On opportunities, governments, what governments can do is to provide them with ideas, you know, okay, this is something you can do, the matching process, or provide information on what's happening. Obviously, states and governments at many different levels have to provide a good regulatory framework in which migrants can work. And I work a lot on diaspora investments, and of course diaspora investment is heavily influenced by um, the regulatory framework. Um, and not just the framework itself, important is also the information on these frameworks. Because often states say, oh, but I have these great, very open investment laws. But if you go to the diaspora and they don't know about it. They think they have to th jump through many, many hoops to, uh, to do something. So information about um, actual rules is as important as the rules themselves. And one thing that I think is the most innovative in this, in this, in this, in this framework is the to influence ability. As Arthur Maria said in her presentation, the agency of the diaspora actors is really important. And we have to increase the capacity of migrants. We have to empower them. We have to build their networks. We have to not just build them for them, but enable them to do that. That means just going to the diaspora and say, please send us money, is not really worth it. It's, it's much better to help them get better jobs, have better resources, and then we can tap into it. Then they will do what they do best, being actors of development. And of course, there's a vector, meaning the more migrants I'm, are abroad, the more this is multiplied and, and, and amplified. Um, um, my second last point is on the ask for stakeholder participation. And that again um, touches on what Maria said on one of her last points about um, who to engage and how to engage. And I have several presentations only on that. I'm really cutting everything really, short, um, really down to minimum here. Um, this is only about non-electoral diaspora participation, not about diaspora voting. Um, 
So first, we can differentiate between diaspora-centered and issue-centered ideas. So sometimes some processes are, have, are only focused on getting the ideas of the diaspora, and some are on an issue, the health bill, and getting the diaspora into an issue, into the health bill, into the general development framework. And we have active and passive ones. Active meaning the government actually more active reaching out, whereas passive is just they're providing opportunity, but they don't actively reach out to the diaspora. And active, for example, we have several councils, diaspora councils, or congresses, platforms where every year the diaspora and the government meets and they discuss several things. For example, I work a lot on Indian diaspora and the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, the big diaspora conference that happens now every other year, early every year, where with two, three, four, five thousand diaspora members and the government are examples of that. Passive, um, of course, online ways. Like they have, like some Moldova, for example, has an, uh, has a, a platform where the diaspora can just suggest things and, and give ideas to the government what to do. Um, um, and the issue center is the same with active and passive. We have the general civil society consultations um, where diaspora can be included, or you have diaspora professional bodies. For example, if a health bill, you go to a diaspora. Um, um, Physicians Association, or you go to the IT Association of the Diaspora if it's, a, if it's an IT related bill, you ask them to provide. Um, and passive again, online, you can just say the Diaspora can use online media, or they can just write a letter on a bill on a, on a project. What's really important here, that's just a, a like broad framework, is to know who is representing the Diaspora. And then again, and um, reiterates just what, what Maria was saying, often and people say, and I work a lot with the UN, who say we need a, a diaspora representative. Or, or I work with a woman from Moldova a lot, and they say, we don't need to know what the diaspora are thinking. I say, no, the, the, the diaspora doesn't think. It's not a person, it's not a group. It's a multiplicity of groups. And while this is easy to understand at a theoretical level, once you engage them and you have to decide who is speaking on behalf of the diaspora, who has the money to fly in, because normally you don't pay those people, like ideally you would, how you choose, and that's, that's, that's actually not easy. And, um, Mexico has a good example how to actually make the diaspora vote for the diaspora representatives in the Spurgeon Council. But that's like, I really recommend you to think if you're engaged in that, who is representing them. The male um, representation is very important. Several clubs and migrant associations are cl cultural clubs of men who come and, and, and play whatever games they do and drink whatever beverage they drink and, and, and socialize. But often that means that women in that, 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 that diaspora are not sufficiently represented. So you have to think only what, what, what kind of associations there are, how is this divided, and how you tamper with that. And um, the very last point, and it's really a short, short reminder about impact analysis. Because we have seen in the last 20 years a lot of different diaspora programs. Diaspora policies, um, and engagement policies, very innovative things. However, what is really missing is to understand how the policy leads to an output and the output to an impact and how all of this is linked together. So what we really have to understand, have a theory of change, how these migration-related policies produce outcomes and impacts. And um, we have to go beyond input and output. So you see a lot of things we see is how much money is channeled, how, much, um, how many people came to a certain um, um, event, etc., how many people were reached in the diaspora. We really need to go beyond these questions. Um, we have to, I think we have to base this on migrants agency and the active um, um, engagement of migrants. And so I'm offering the ADAPT frame where we see, okay, how many migrants actually feel enabled, their decisions are affected by these things, how many people know about certain rules. And of course we have to allow for heterogeneity among diasporas, again, to not just see the diasporas doing something, but how do different policies affect different segments of the diaspora, be it by age, be it by gender, be it by, by wave of emigration, etc. So that's really important to not just think about how does this affect the diaspora, but think more nuanced about these things. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. three, five minutes, and I'll try and be strict on the time, um, I'll to give some comments on the two present excellent presentations, <coughs> and then there'll be an opportunity to open the wider debate. So, um, Angel, would you like to start off? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks to Maria and Daniel for 
very engaging and passionate presentation. Uh, and uh, also congratulations to Daniel for doing so with the jet lag. Not that <laughs> obvious. Um, a few questions. I must uh, admit, because uh, the, knowing the project of Maria and not the one of Daniel, since Maria is supported by ERC, uh, I have focused mainly on her project. But I think that uh, some of the questions can be for both. Um, starting with, with the first, um, in your method, Maria, and this starts with, the, with a very basic assumption that I think we all share. For research to do something useful uh, and having good impacts for policy and society research needs, first of all, to be good. Right, so that's uh, the, as the assumption we all share, and part of my question would be to push you a little bit more on the actually making of research and also the impact of that. So uh, to start with, with Maria, you were speaking about the sample of interviews you have been uh, taking uh, care of. And I would like to ask you maybe to explain a little bit how you're going to um, cross your, uh, your interviews and your survey, because those are quite different uh, sources and very important ones. And also speaking, especially about the interviews, but also the survey, uh, how, you, how you have been handling ethical aspects uh, when you're, particularly when you interview vulnerable groups, and many of the diasporas, particularly conflict generation, the generated diasporas are vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. um, then some question that um, also come with regard to your project, Maria, and one is that you started discussing or mentioning mobilization in the European space, but you didn't have the time to, uh, how to say, to, to, to give us more examples. So what, what do you see as an emergence of mobilization uh, in the European space? What are the spaces? Is the European Parliament? Are the European policies, uh, you know, the migration policy or transnational justice efforts and others? Um, what is that you were hinting to? And the other three questions, very quickly, I think are for both of you. One is whether you see instances where diasporas or diasporas entrepreneurs, using the words of uh, Maria, do learn from each other. Surely there have been cases of joint activities or activities where some diasporas learn from each other, whether it is about uh, calling for certain legal framework or certain types of uh, activities, mobilizations, uh, dealing with remittances, by the way, and so on. Uh, do you have examples of this learning uh, being done, I'll say, in an either explicit way or you think in a more indirect one? Um, in Maria's papers, sometimes you refer also to think tanks or researchers from diasporas. And uh, Daniel uh, mentioned uh, diasporas with regard to science. And actually, both Elizabeth and I have been involved in some kind of activities called science diplomacy. We also had a conference at ERC last year. So the question would be, do you see a specific role of scientific diasporas in leading to more engagement and empowerment of diasporas? Uh, and if so, how? Um, and to finish with the last, since I spoke about engagement and empowerment, you did both uh, emphasize the importance of empowering and engaging, how to say, constructively with diasporas. I think we all agree. Um, what about the less funny part or less positive part of instrumentalization of diasporas? But there were six <laughs> good questions on there. I don't know if you would like to just note those questions. We go on to our next respondents I think um, and then we'll take those questions at the end so that will cover some of the audience's questions I think but there were six good questions there and I think mixed up a bit mainly to Maria but one or two to Daniel as well so um, I think uh, would we go on to our Elizabeth would you like just to comment as well please? yes thank you very much um, first of all thank you very much for the invitation to be here and, uh, it was a ple pleasure to hear both presentations and uh, I am sure I will come out with a lot of uh, ideas. And I will, uh, I mean, my um, comments will be complementary to what uh, Angela did, but a bit different also. So um, my, I, I want to say that, OK, I work in digital research and innovation, and my unit is in charge of the what we call societal challenge six, 
which is the societal challenge of Horizon 2020, dealing with all issues uh, important discussed today. I mean, uh, number one issue is migration. So, and um, me, I would like to have few comments, and I, and I would like to follow the, the structure of past, present, and future. So past, I would like to say that we finance a lot of uh, projects dealing also with issues of diaspora under the Seven Framework Program, which they give results today. And I would like to mention two of them. And this is the project, we had a project named was MAFE and Other Temper, which they studied diasporas, specifically from Ghana, coming from Ghana to Europe, Senegal, and uh, Morocco. And they found out, I mean, uh, they had findings, and they are um, in agreement with what was presented. I mean, in general, they found out that when the host countries they have uh, schemes and they permit uh, the migrants to, to have a fast legal status in the host country, then these diasporas help uh, both the country of the, the impact they have in the country of origin and in the country of destination is very big. So uh, at the same time, uh, discussing with the colleagues managing this project, they told me the following, okay, we studied these countries but it's not sure that the same applies if we study a, country, a group of countries in the Middle East. It's not easy, it's certain at all. It applies to, uh, to countries um, from Asia. Mm -hmm. So depending the continent, the grouping of countries, maybe we see a bit different things. So would, for me, one question it will be, one thing is group from countries from Africa, but then do we have any comparisons between different diasporas coming from different continents? So that is one thing. The second thing is, this is about a bit the past, but right now we are just finalizing evaluations of uh, some projects and some uh, research projects under the framework program. These are a bit different projects than the project financed by the ERC. Uh, they applied to a call for proposals in which we defined the terms. And we have, uh, uh, we had to put in the 2017 work program projects dealing with uh, science diplomacy and migration. There are a number of projects there. Actually, we gave 15 million euros to projects dealing in all aspects of migration. And amongst them, there are two platforms. One, a social platform, uh, with a very important budget, which put together different stakeholders, including civil society organizations, also diaspora organizations, uh, international organizations, dealing with the integration of migrants. And another one, which we call a research platform, which um, uh, looks to and compares uh, of what is happening um, in different European countries. So uh, here I stop and say that, okay, besides the different projects and they will soon be implemented now, and some of them, they also deal with the important issues of science diplomacy, and I, to this I, um, I join Angela to the question, she asked how diaspora could really contribute to this. I would like to say in relation to the two platforms, which will be directly managed by DG Research, and uh, innovation, how, uh, what can we do, and because there are platforms, how, if there are any ideas or mechanisms to include more uh, in the work they will do, diaspora organizations, or any idea that you could give to us to increase the impact of these platforms. And the third thing is how to do with the future. And right now, we are preparing uh, the work program 2018-2020, for which we will devote, this is an open secret, so I think I can say it. Uh, <laughs> we will devote uh, a very important part of the budget uh, is, uh, to migration issues. So the, this 2018-2020 work program of the societal challenge I mentioned before, focusing three big themes. And number one is migration. And 
okay, I don't want to give it a number, but that is a very important part of the budget. It will be much bigger than what I mentioned for the World Program 2017, will be voted on this issue. And therefore, for me, it will be important to hear uh, from you if there are issues uh, that they are not well addressed so far, which they should find their way to be better addressed in this world program, which is the last of Horizon 2020 and the most important. What were the other two hot topics? Is that migration and what were the other two? The second uh, uh, topic it is the socio-economic and cultural impacts, uh, socio-economic and cultural transformations from of the fourth industrial revolution is the second uh, big avenue. And uh, the third one are issues related to governance. Thanks very much. It's just early intelligence. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thanks very much. Uh, now we go to our third speaker, Mingel Heidak. She's from the Danish Refugee Council. She has a few comments, please. I think uh, thanks a lot for your presentations. They were quite interesting. I don't think I have as many questions as the, the two of you had to the, to the content of the presentations because I'm coming from a slightly different angle to this work, coming from a a humanitarian organization working in about 40 countries around the globe with humanitarian uh, displacement related issues and part of the work we do is working with uh, diaspora's engagement in humanitarian assistance and in, in development or maybe you should phrase it as the solutions to displacement the kind of longer term approach from the humanitarian side to development assistance um, so for me it was more interesting to hear how the research you have done and the results you have actually kind of validate some of our approaches as practitioners working with uh, diaspora engagement rather than from, from the research side, what else you should be looking at. Um, what we have been doing at DRC, working with uh, the diaspora is support diaspora engagement practically in terms of uh, financing and capacity building diaspora organizations to engage in <coughs> rehabilitation and reconstruction projects in their countries of origin. But we have also more recently started engaging diasporas uh, at a more consultative level towards, uh, among other things, durable solutions in, uh, in the MENA region to the Syrian displacement crisis. Um, exactly a point towards what you have been saying, just to be proactive and, and uh, give a voice to diaspora as part of a civil society that has moved from country of origin, but in the Syrian and many displacement situations, will also return at some point to engage them and give them a voice in, in, in future design of the solutions of their own displacement uh, scenarios. And, uh, and the same goes for, for the mixed migration, which also has been mentioned uh, several times, uh, where it for us has been uh, important to look at how diasporas themselves look at their role on, uh, in migration, in, in, in the push and pull factors of migration, and what they can conceive of as their potential future role uh, in collaboration with organizations such as ours working with the protection of refugees and, and migrants as well. Um, but also with regards to policy development in, in their country of residence. And uh, I just like the fact that both of you uh, had a strong uh, focus on, on the agency of diasporas themselves, that it's, we shouldn't be speaking on behalf of them, but we should be speaking with them. And I think it's a really important point as well to separate, to look at different diasporas in different countries of residence, because they're, they're different. The so Somali diaspora in Denmark is by no means the same as the Somali diaspora in the UK or in the <coughs> US. And if you want to engage them in, in, in policies and, and programming as well and, and direct collaboration, I think you need to look at those differences and, and, uh, and, and do contextual, contextualize collaborations. And uh, also in terms of some of the things you have been mentioning, for us it has been very much a learning in terms of focusing on cooperation rather than co-option and, and on facilitation rather than instrumentalization because I think that's what has been done over the years uh, to a uh, much too high degree. So, yeah. Not so many questions, uh, but oh yes, you are working with your research towards policy makers, but I do think there's quite a, a large ground to also collaborate with organizations like ours mm -hmm. and others that are operationally engaged in working with diaspora uh, engagement. And uh, we actually do have a, a network of organizations who across Europe facilitate diaspora engagement as non-political and, and non, I mean, as players that seek to facilitate and enhance diaspora's own wish to engage. 
and it's called Diagram, Diaspora Grant Maker Network. Diaspora? Um, Diaspora Grant Makers. It's the organizations in Germany, UK, mm -hmm. Norway, uh, Sweden, and, and Denmark. And GIZ, among others, is here as well. <laughs> um, and I think our work uh, and, and the data we can deliver as well in terms of actual collaboration with that, as well as a long-term collaboration. We've been working with Somalis and Afghans for the past eight years. Having access to those networks and the work we're doing might also qualify the research that will then help policymakers to engage. Um, I wouldn't suggest you found it all ten, but what would be nice is to select some comments that you would like to respond because we would like to bring the audience in in a moment. So, who would like to start? Uh, start. Uh, thank you. Okay, Th thanks a lot uh, for wonderful comments. This is what we were really looking for. So, um, Angela had a lot of questions about method, and uh, I have to tell you I'm very proud of the project and its methodology. Because we started, the, the project was meant to be from comparative case studies uh, emerging into quantitative analysis. And um, uh, what we did, and one of the videos is really talking about this um, in very big detail, is about how we had several stages of coding, of grounded coding among different members. So we sampled different interviews, so we coded them. Then that left to certain extrapolations, so to a code book. And then from this uh, bottom-up uh, coding, which is grounded coding, then we have certain coding which was then extrapolated on a number of other interviews, which are the subject of that paper. And we had um, them divided according to conversational moves which creates the opportunity for the um, uh, multiple correspondence analysis to mine the field of diaspora mobilization where this profile is somehow coming <coughs> up. We still are working on that paper, but with uh, several, uh, several trashes of interviews, we are seeing that these are some of the findings out there. So what has been happening, so for very important has been for me to emerge, not simply that I talk about de facto states and somebody else talks about transitional justice, but everybody has their own small parts in which they work because everybody needs their own creativity in a different way to answer the question is just the center one. But then there is a, a level of the project which is a common one, and from that one we derive these ideas about the multiple correspondence analysis, the <coughs> enormous coding procedure that has been going on for about two years on different levels because we wanted to figure out before uh, the survey is being put into implementation what are the most important variables that we need to look into. So then looking into that one, uh, the survey has been created, um, I mean, we had a lot of code books. I mean, we can provide all this information if you're interested. Code books on the one, code books on the survey, um, uh, which are which were creating uh, the, the opportunity to think about it. So um, the whole aspect of the survey is that, first of all, it is about 25 minutes, and it cannot go very further in terms of time. In that sense, we had to select the most important variables. Uh, but we also had an eye about what we found about the people who are the mobilizers and what the questions are about them. So they spoke a lot, a lot about access. But we have spoken also to those people who are not so much thinking about access, but are talking about transnational families, transnational voting, transnational. So some of these questions were really um, emphasized, and especially the transit. We will see how, how it works. We even created a survey experiment about seeing these critical events, how much they connect to people, because we saw that in the field of diaspora mobilizers, critical events are important, but not probably as important as the hypothesis goes they would be for regular uh, diaspora members because we saw these mechanisms are very emotional. They're not so rationalized. So in that sense, I think I'm, I'm really proud about all of this evolution that has taken a lot of a lot of time and effort to be very systematic. We have a lot of code books and uh, I think that the research underpinning the findings will be will be very, very meaningful. <coughs> so you asked me the, the, you asked me about the mobilization in the about uh, ethics. Uh, ethic has been a big issue uh, usually of the ERC, but everybody else. So it has been 
a lot of uh, uh, explaining to everybody who was uh, conducting interviews how ethical procedures need to go, so how letters need to be given, how letters need to be uh, informed constant sheets need to be signed and and all of this and very much sensitivity towards uh, the vulnerability dynamic when uh, when that was happening so we haven't had any complaints which is pretty good as a result if you think about that so um, uh, what you're saying about the instances of the European space um, it is a, it, this project is about Europe, but we cannot forget that these diasporas are in these big fields and, and you could see how much um, uh, connectivity to the US, for example, matters or connectivity to the Middle East uh, uh, and to the Balkans. So it is about the European space, but it is in its connectivity to others. So you cannot get out of, out of that dynamic, so even if you want to. But what happens in the different contexts, you could see, for example, Miss Sweden is a country that has been pretty open for refugees, and uh, self-selection dynamics into UK have been more about wealthier people if they, if they want to go into, into the country. I mean, in Germany, there has been uh, ups and downs with the uh, different integration processes. People are not as mobilized. So it is patchy, and in certain places like London, I mean, this is what we were working also with another colleague of Johan Ramstone. So it's, um, um, uh, you could see a lot more mo mobilization dynamic in a, in a global city, but then this is what I was mentioning about uh, The Hague, for example, it becomes another space, or um, uh, you could definitely think about uh, specific ways in which uh, these translocal spaces become much more mobilized. In one place you're more mobilized than in another. And that view of this enormous immersion into, into detail, which we have done from bottom up in to so many interviews, I think are informing, uh, informing a lot of what we are doing as scholars, but I think we'll have much more validity uh, then data sets that are created out of secondary information uh, which come out of media and are not so uh, so rigorous in terms of the methodology that has uh, dealt with them. Sorry, can I stop you there? Sorry, I just want to get, bring Daniel in as well. Can diasporas learn from each other? And I think Mingo made the point that all mm -hmm. each diaspora seems to be very different. They can. And whether there's any point yeah, is this very individualistic looking or are there lessons that can be learned between us that are learning? So I'll bring Daniel in for a couple of responses. Um, sure, and I was combine that maybe with the instrumentalization of the diaspora, so like not the same, but it can be related. Um, but what we see, of course, is that several institutions, IOM, for example, and others are do, trying to do peer-to-peer um, um, -peer learning for people engaged in diaspora policy, so the state level again, not the diaspora level. So there we can see more and more in the project I've been working on, the global um, project in mainstream migration international development strategies, um, co-led by UNDP and the IOM, we have several like, these processes. But sometimes leads also to bringing diaspora groups in there. Um, we have some instances where, from, for example, the, um, um, in the Indian diaspora in the United States, as I studied extensively, um, looked at what the, um, the Israeli diaspora, the Jewish diaspora did with the political action committees. So they actually like, like met with them, asked how do you structure your political action policies, and the, and the, the Indian, um, in, in Indian political action committee impact was like modeled after the, uh, the, the IPAC, the Israeli um, political action committee. Um, there are instances where this happens, but still, the aspers often don't look too much at others. So they say still, like the learning in terms of, um, but with my own experience at least, I can't speak for all the aspers. So the generalizability that Elizabeth was talking about is, <coughs> is, is, is in every research and every impression that we have is limited. I mean, there's nobody who knows the entire world in every single sub diaspora, I, I claim. Um, so I have done pretty good um, research in about 30 different diasporas. Um, um, so, um, so I think there is definitely room for that, for, for letting, and then sometimes you find these regional diasporas, for example, again, diaspora, the South Asian diaspora I work in, and where then you find the Indian diaspora and the Pakistani and the Nepalese diaspora come together because they find often, oh, yeah, it's also Asian, you know, it's like a nice Desi, which is another label put on top of this, that, that can work for them to, 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 to work better to get the Latino diaspora, again, a label that is more 
from external, not an internal label, but it had implications on how the group within each other has um, identified, etc. cetera, the, 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 the internalization of these processes has an impact. But we haven't seen a global um, forum where diasporas learn from each other. There definitely there is like this, this homeland fixation more than just because somebody else is a diaspora has learned from them. But I think, I think we can learn, look at that. Um, um, Angela mentioned um, the instrumentalization of the diaspora. And I think um, that that's a very interesting part. It has many different angles as I can see it. One is instrumentation by the diaspora, uh, of the diaspora, by the diaspora. Another is by the state. So let's so start by the state. Of course, states sometimes instrumentalize diasporas. They either co-opt them, uh, trying to like trying to trying to to take the diaspora demands and trying to mold them into something. They're often trying to try. I mean, the diaspora itself. The, the idea is often influenced by what governments do. Governments create diaspora. They reinforce the, uh, the identities often in form of governmentability and as back to bring Foucault, like they're bringing, trying to bring this 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 biological idea of you belong to us because you're great 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 parents. I mean, this is. It's, from an ethical point of view, it's also there's something primordial about this idea that you say you are diaspora because your ancestors came from um, a certain area. So my last name is Lithuanian. I would not claim any Lithuanian ethnicity, um, but um, I guess I could because it's my last name, and, and but that wouldn't be normatively okay. So I think, um, and, and the <laughs> last one is, um, of course, the states can instrumentalize the diaspora against local populations. So what Erdogan is doing and some others are doing, trying to get support from the diaspora at the expense sometimes of local populations. And there you get entire diaspora voting, diaspora, what kind of political influence should the diaspora have? I personally am not opposed to political influence per se, but of course in like looking at Haiti um, or looking at, 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 at Cape Verde, which have a huge diaspora, which the diaspora is three times more than the local population. Well, if, if, if ever they ask for the same vote as the people, local people, then the diaspora can completely dominate politics and what's happening. And that doesn't sound fair either. So I think um, um, that, that can be something instrumentalized by policymakers. <laughs> and again, by diaspora um, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs not financial entrepreneurs, but more like, like ideas entrepreneurs and people who are leaders, they often use the idea of the diaspora today, they claim to represent the diaspora, they try to instrumentalize, say, the diaspora wants this and that. You can see that. Some people just say, we have the National Association for the, for the Kenyan diaspora in the UK and, and the diaspora wants this. Like, they're not elected, they're not, they're not but they often instrumentalize the, the idea that the lack of the formal governance structures to put certain particular strict demands forward. So that's something we have to be aware of that somebody speaking on behalf of the diaspora, like with what kind of legit, legit, legitimacy these people can talk about that. Um, I think as policymakers, as people in the field, being in civil societies, being academics, we just have to look out for those things. We have to understand where this is happening. Um, I don't have a formal theory yet how, where this, what makes it easier, but it's definitely happening. Thank you. Amigdo, you had a quick question, I think. No, it was more a comment in mm -hmm. terms of the P2P and whether or not that's possible and, and relevant. And I think our, I, th I think the question is whether or not you look at that at a kind of global, large-scale level, or if you again look at self-interest and, and what type of engagement which diaspora or which group within one diaspora is interested in. Because we have actually been doing peer-to-peer -peer quite a lot in, in, in terms of our humanitarian facilitation of humanitarian engagement between diasporas and the system, the humanitarian system. Because we do work in silos and we're trying to better that. <laughs> and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer we did there was between Sierra Leonean diaspora, uh, Syrian diaspora and Somali diaspora all engaged in, in uh, responding to emergencies in their countries of origin. And they were highly interested in, in, in the peer to peer, in, in the learning from each other, both in terms of some organizations being more mature than others, but also what in countries. Sorry. Somalia, Sierra, Sierra Leone, and uh, Syria. And it's, it's going to be Nigeria as well. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they were very interested in, 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 uh, in the peer to peer discussions amongst each other in terms of more and less mature organizations, but also we took the Syrian and the Somalian diaspora to. Sierra Leone to watch what, what kind of projects they had been doing in, in emergency response and the same the other way around. And they were highly appreciative and they wanted it and they're actually continuing to do it even without <coughs> external facilitation. So, so I think that's a very worthwhile activity to engage in. 
So, I mean, uh, the learning, I think it's really interesting and uh, that peer-to-peer, -peer, what you're saying, is very is very good in, in a certain sense that to be facilitated through it. It's in a certain way, you do have that learning experience, but it may be also not for the best uh, in many ways. Um, uh, so we, I mean, there were some examples, for example, about when the Palestinians were seeking statehood, they were talking to customers about their strategies and how this was, whether it's good or bad, I mean, you judge it yourself. So this was this kind of diffusion effects, especially in environments which are very multicultural, and you could see that um, uh, in a certain way, how do you pursue, um, pursue independence uh, more, more vigorously. Um, other ways of learning have been um, by people probably of your type who are engaged, were engaged with humanitarian processes. Um, we haven't written about this in a, in a yet, uh, probably it will come as a paper if you give us this inspiration. <laughs> but um, uh, that <coughs> is something that a lot of this, uh, um, people who have been engaged in previous uh, humanitarian crises like Bosnia, Kosovo, etc., and, and these are they are turn into being diaspora entrepreneurs. So they have been engaging with more recent uh, movements like uh, uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, etc. So bringing up their knowledge into into the local scene uh, in that kind of learning. One question here, one here. So we'll take the two questions first of all. Now, because you say. Where are you from? You, uh, My name is Marie Chantal Rutonze. I'm, I'm the president of the African Diaspora Network in Europe. And I would uh, uh, <laughs> assure uh, Ms. Nan Nojek, uh, I'm elected. Uh, the African Diaspora Network in Europe is an umbrella organization of more than 50 associations uh, that <coughs> they really work together to speak with similar voice to policymakers. And I like it, uh, what you said about uh, um, that's for a participation because when we created this organization, the main concern was uh, who speaking the name of the diaspora. And uh, when we approached you know, institutions, they always say there are so many organizations, who do we speak to? So um, uh, uh, it's my intervention is like a comment. Uh, just to inform you about the existence of uh, this organization. And I would like to know if there is any follow-up work after this meeting. I uh, will we'll be very interested in participating. So I will not take too much time. No. Uh, <coughs> but thanks for comment. And there is a networking opportunity in a moment. Sir, I think you have Yeah, OK. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Moni. I'm, uh, I have a long experience in the European Commission. I'm still uh, active there as, uh, as, uh, as advisor. Um, I would suggest, uh, particularly taking into account what uh, Madame Melitiato said, uh, put things in perspective, I would suggest uh, to make a linkage between your research, uh, current and future research, and the European policy, policy making in the next few years, referring to the team. Now, the first uh, immediate consideration is a European budget. Uh, are we going to consider a special fund for migration, for returnees, for uh, inclusion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the European budget, 2020-2027. 20, First issue. Second issue is uh, the relationship between migration and populism, and the electoral cycles in Europe. Um, are we sure that uh, opening borders uh, may facilitate the life of our future leaders? Are we sure that the future leaders may take the risk uh, to uh, put in danger their own political <coughs> life uh, if uh, they are too much uh, open to migration. Merkel is a case, but uh, we have also a new generation of European leaders in France and wherever. Second issue. The third issue is uh, 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 migration and security. Uh, security not only in terms of terrorism, but also security in terms of uh, personal security. People are safe in towns dominated by uh, migrants. Uh, there is a lot of sociology, a lot of sociological work which has been done in this respect. We have ghettos, we have cities, we have people integrated or not integrated. So we have a wide variety of situations in Europe uh, which uh, uh, merit uh, particular attention in this respect. Then there is the issue of, as you mentioned, uh, uh, SDGs, but uh, uh, migration and development. Uh, the future migrants will continue to come to Europe and they will continue to come from Africa. 
We have a, a big problem for Europe, it is certainly is a Syria, but Syria is a conflict. Once the conflict is over, like in Kosovo, you have the return of uh, Syrian migrants to Syria to rebuild the country. But Africa is a major problem because you have a structural lack of development in this continent whose demography is very is, is increasing. 1.2 billion Africans today. And there will be 1.5 and maybe 2 billion. Even North Africa has a demography which is unsustainable. So uh, we have the Juncker Plan, the, the, the international, the external Juncker Plan, not the, the, the one for Europe, but the one for uh, the neighboring countries and Africa. Are we sure that this money is enough? Are we sure that, uh, OK, so this is uh, another, another important Thank issue. Then uh, there is uh, the inclusion of migrants in Europe. I have to stop you a minute. No, just to yeah. uh, finish. And uh, here you have to consider the migrants within Europe, by in, in, among European member states, you have migrants from Romania, from uh, Bulgaria, from Spain, from Italy, whatever, so within Europe, but also you have migrants coming from outside Europe. And uh, these typologies, these are two different typologies, deserve uh, two different responses. So this is for future, uh, for future research. It might be. I'm not sure who would like to pick these points up, but then migration and budget, yeah. Yeah. population security and development, and one last question. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Peter Boni, working for GIZ, having been mentioned twice already, even though not having been um, registered properly before, I took the liberty of sneaking in here, and I, first of all, let me say I'm very happy having done so, because it was very, very fruitful already. Thank you for that. I would like to add also one more point on for future research, this kind of thing. From the perspective of um, development cooperation, I think we're looking back at a long, quite a long history of learning and getting aware about the merits of diaspora, diaspora can have for development. And um, we're going kind of into a different, into a new era nowadays, which have been kind of been framed by the gentleman before, right before me. And I would like to put this into the room because I just came over from a different meeting, which was about from DJ Home being about um, creating awareness and information campaigns to combat the root causes of migration. And one chapter was how to involve diasporas in there. So how to engage diasporas in two fields. One is awareness about migration, stopping people from migrate. Second is supporting return policies. I can say from our practical work, we even see diaspora actors getting engaged in this one as well. But I think this is now really opening a box where a lot of research um, will be necessary, and we are still about to develop our own, let's say, practical questions to the issue. I just wanted to throw this towards you guys. <laughs> I've been talking about this with um, Daniel before, about these um, challenges we are facing, and um, also for future research. And maybe you, I can also already mention some some issues you're working on that on that on that um, thank you for the question well, then, that's it. i think we'll call it at that to the stop of those questions maybe we should send a link of the uh, brochure that our colleagues in rtd uh, made which is a policy synthesis of research on uh, migration in the collaborative research part of the program <coughs> this is to say that Many of those issues, uh, the relation with populace, the relation with security, cities, uh, um, uh, home affairs policies, and the complicated issues of asking diasporas to help with return policies, which bear the questions of uh, what is the assessment of whether return policy work and how and under which conditions in the first place, before we ask them. That's personal note or footnote on the matter, is to say that a lot of research is there. Uh, and of course, we need more research based on the premises that we built on the research we have. So this is just an invitation for our colleagues who really uh, pose interesting questions to our two researchers here that cannot be only on the shoulder of Daniel and Maria to address those <laughs> questions because they go much beyond uh, the issues they have been focusing on and you know this brochure and the one of our colleagues at least gives some ideas of how the breadth and depth of research on this issue and of course why we need to continue because the issue transform itself 
uh, quite a lot. Um, actually, to our colleague who was telling us about this umbrella organization of uh, African diasporas, this actually connects to the question I have for Maria about the fact that um, we are aware of several umbrella organizations that act in the European Union public space. Um, and this is also the reason why, for example, the European Parliament had hearings and initiatives on the Armenian genocide or on Kosovo, let alone the Palestinian question. So the question was really, do they act by learning from each other, peer-to-peer, -peer and uh, you know, other networking, and uh, you know, diasporas, which are indeed very different. The same diasporas in different countries are very different. But when do they decide, for example, to join forces to address uh, Den Haag, the International Tribunal, or European Union institutions. And the role of this umbrella organization is it that you're capable of federating some of the diasporas that otherwise are very isolated in the different host countries, or, for example, you know, only some of the African diasporas in your case, or Middle Eastern diasporas engage also with this uh, kind of organization. So that was. Thanks for that. Yeah. She would like us to respond. Yes, okay, maybe I could uh, add a few points. Um, yeah, from uh, my side, I find this uh, conversation very interesting. And <coughs> since we are, uh, our work in the DG research is to uh, contribute to to build uh, work programs with uh, are based really on most uh, uh, important research needs. Uh, I heard a number of things that I think are important and uh, based on what I know, of course, that we have research on all of these issues. There is a lot of research ongoing. There are many framework programs and they finance research on migration. At the same time, uh, we see that the situations change, the international setting is changing, new issues are on the table we didn't have before. Just one year ago we had a very big conference on uh, research on migration, um, the, on the challenge of migration organized by DG Research, and, uh, and we had based this conference on a policy review of the key project we finance on migration, and this policy review is available on our website. And then uh, on the conference we had uh, discussed a lot of things amongst uh, which, okay, which are key results we have, but what are new research needs we have now, and what are the recommendations for policy making we can uh, put uh, on the table. And uh, out of this there is a, was a publication that is uh, just less than one year old, also on uh, the web which I will invite you at least for the few pages at the end that it puts together most, uh, you know, up-to-date research needs and at the same time recommendations for policy making to, to consult. And if you think that there are things that you would like to further contribute, there is an open invitation to, to contribute uh, to <coughs> us. Uh, we have also discussed quite a lot about the future work program with our advisor group. Uh, it's a group of independent experts, and their report, which it indicates the three big avenues I gave you, it is also on the web. And and in general, we are trying to. I mean, we work, of course, we have a way of working. Uh, I mean, with program co member states, the program committee, advisory groups, and a number of other things. But also, we are. Uh, uh, taking it seriously into account the input we, we receive from the research community. So it is an open invitation on, uh, on this regard. On this regard, and I, did, and I can say that there are some, in the issue of diaspora, at least on the project we finance through the framework program, yes, it exists, but not on, it has not the weight that many other issues had. And then this is something that we um, addressed in 2017, and I think it will be also part of very likely what we will do for the future. Thanks Thanks. For I think the last, Linda, do you have a last word, or Nefna, I'll go to Daniel and Maria too. Just on, 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 on the how to engage my, that my diaspora in return and, and, and migration information uh, is also a question with tackling in the DRC and, and, and the operational response 
to policymakers approaching us and saying we want to work with diaspora to return people, we want to work with diaspora to keep people where they are. And um, what we've been doing so far is to, to try to, to, to engage with the diaspora. We did one pilot research project, I mentioned it, on, together with the Regional Mixed Migration Secretariat in the Horn of Africa. Uh, engaging with Somalis and Afghans in Denmark on their opinion on, on migration trends and the ro their own role in it. And I think part of it that was really in interesting is that they want to engage and they're willing to engage, but not as a policy instrument, but in terms of their current already existing engagement of being a network of trust for new arrivals, for people that are on the move, for people that, that consider to move. They are already engaged with them, uh, and they are, I mean, they're asylum counselors for Ill illegal migrants. That, that's diaspora. That's not the Danish Refugee Council that has an <coughs> asylum uh, uh, counseling department, actually. Um, and, and they're very interested in having the right information to enable people to make a qualified choice on, on, on their migration, on their movements. Um, but they're not willing to be engaged in, in, uh, in um, rejected asylum seeker return, and, and they're not willing to engage in terms of purporting or, or, or presenting government policies in that regard. They might not agree with it. And I think another point that came from, from that research in the group that we talked to, also uh, talking to Somalis in Denmark and having them make an advisory board for our own asylum department and the ministry that's working with our asylum department, was that, um, oh, I lost my point. Yeah, that's my point. <laughs> <laughs> Brief concluding remarks. First, I think from Daniel and then Maria, the, the final remarks. So, Daniel, show sure. Me, um, briefly have, um, uh, again, three things, and uh, very briefly, that, that resulted. One that we haven't talked about, and that both um, Elizabeth and um, Angela talked about, was um, scientific diasporas. Um, and then we could talk about the root causes, like um, both um, Peter Bonin and Monsieur Moni. Um, mentioned um, as well as security angle. Um, very briefly, scientific diasporas, what we look at one thing is called social remittances. And most, most many people who have heard that, like the idea that we don't have only financial remittances, but um, ideas, knowledge, um, social norms being sent back. I don't prefer the term, but it's, it's very established now that we call these social remittances. Um, and, and scientific diasporas often have a very strong um, um, emphasis on that, be it by the actually doing research collaborations, by returning, by so virtual return where they can either teach um, the internet or something like that, by um, um, facilitating access to networks um, through people who are at home, or um, access to funding, for example, or also by changing the norms of how research is done. For example, more gender equality norms in the research areas, more um, scientifically minded ideas in, 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 in their home country. Um, the real C problem is there, like several countries do mappings. Bosnia, for example, I work with the government of Bosnia and UDP in Bosnia, and we did a huge mapping of the scientific diaspora, mostly in the United States. Um, and um, that can be a good thing. You have, a, you know, who, where are experts, you can reach out to them, you can tr engage them in, in, in corporations. Um, but often it is the problem of the local reception context, which is problematic. So even if people come back, there are like small epistemic communities of, of scholars who don't want these people, these idea of, oh, you think you're a big shot from your US university or UK university. Um, um, that's like these social norms are hugely problematic. Flexibility um, is, um, is, is, is an issue for most of these programs, like the, the sub programs of, of facilitating the temporary return. They're not flexible enough, they don't meet the demands of these, these people. And often it is focusing only on diaspora and individuals. I think what, where the future of diaspora policies lies is the integration to really look at the, not at how they can the diaspora contribute, but look at the specific issue and see, okay, here's a diaspora person, here's a non-diaspora person, he is, a, he is an external person who is not ethnically related to us, who can also contribute, and we just look at that more broadly in an integrated way. Um, briefly on root causes. Um, I'm very critical uh, about um, many, many ways how, um, like the Valletta conference um, a year and a half ago, how the EU is trying to like, um, give money to prevent migration, which is like, sometimes labeled like that. It's because it's, it's ethically very problematic. Um, and first, open borders, who are we to close our borders? Yeah, from public international law, we can do that. But if you look at moral arguments, we don't have strong arguments to say just because we can do it doesn't, doesn't give us a right to do it. 
Um, but um, so if you want to read about that, read Joe Karen's book, The Ethics of Immigration, came out two years ago, an excellent book um, on, on the ethics of that. From a policy perspective also, um, it's often not very effective. We, we know that um, giving people more jobs and more education and more health doesn't mean that less people will come. Because unless they're all blooming landscapes with perfect, decent jobs and great um, healthcare systems, um, it's not likely that uh, that many people will stay home because of that. Having these informational campaigns with telling people, stay home, it's bad here, we have racism, we don't like you, you stay better, stay home. Again, personally, I'm, it may work, it probably won't work, but it may work, but I'm not sure that's the right way. And I think what is the right way is to embrace more liberal migration regimes. And we have to, of course, take care of the negative sides. And I'm right now, so I live in the United States. Um, we have a president who got elected partly because of the fears associated with immigration, not because of immigration, because of fears associated with immigration. It's an important distinction there. So what I often say, and I have a lot of interviews these days about the Trump administration, I tell them the biggest fear, the biggest negative impact of immigration is a backlash. And of course we can avoid the backlash by just not emitting immigrants. But I don't think that's the right choice we have to do. It, it is we have to emit more immigrants and be better in managing the expectations of the, of the public to, ex and to, to narrative, to, to come, to talk to people and bring them together with migrants. And then we can avoid that some populist leaders come in and still have migration. Okay, I'm not talking. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your, for your great comments. And we'll have more time in the reception afterwards. Really yeah, it's a brief conclusion, and thank you very much for an excellent conversation. Three points. About the scientific diaspora, I think that what uh, Daniel has said is very good and very important, very interesting, but it does apply a lot to states that are full-fledged states and do not have that much contested sovereignty. So in a certain way, what we have seen, as I mentioned, uh, people from Kosovo in, in Sweden may be helpful on building a curriculum, they may be going back to the country, in very atomized ways, but the state, before it is concluding state building processes, is really interested in a national agenda, in a financing agenda, in anything that is related to the diplomatic statehood. And we see also issues with transitional justice that they do not pick up gender issues, do not pick up a lot of things which one would assume that they may be very important, they wouldn't pick up. So in that sense, we really need to think about the context of contested sovereignty and there. Another thing is about the coalition building um, and the learning experience and coming back to that, but it is among certain diasporas that they create coalitions with others. It's not simply that they learn from each other. I mean, you mentioned the Armenian diaspora in which I have worked, for example. They have built two types of coalitions. One was, is a little bit of a loose coalition with Kurds because they have been trying to pressure Turkey in the uh, processes of European integration. And that has been loose coalitions, but if you go somewhere on a uh, Armenian or on a Kurdish event, you could see the other people there distributing leaflets, etc. And the Armenians have also in Sweden very much mobilized when they wanted the genocide recognition with other groups uh, like um, uh, Pontic Greeks, for example, who are not that big in other countries, but uh, for some reason in Sweden are mobilized to create these coalitions to pressure the parliament locally for this, uh, for this uh, movements because they are coalitions, but it is built so much not only learning, Basis, it is much more kind of a rational coalition really. And the final part about this, the new <coughs> times, I uh, completely agree with Daniel that a lot of uh, us who are in the scholarly field and trying to connect to the policy world would need to think about the moral implications of what's happening. But what I'm seeing is this closure of spaces um, uh, with regard to the nation state taking very quickly onwards and trying uh, all this process that a couple of years ago would almost be unacceptable about co-opting diasporas and sending to, to influence their own people to go back uh, uh, to their countries of origin while they know what kind of fate they, uh, they are doomed there uh, in a certain way. But I do think that this is the new game in town and we need to adjust our our approaches about how we deal with that in order to be able not to stay, uh, um, not to support this process, but be able in a certain way to maintain liberal ideas and liberal understanding in a world that is not very conducive to that.